number six, Come Thou Almighty King. Christina? 646. Six hundred and forty six. Give up your best to the master.
else have any favorites? Yes, and Jenny? 428. Let our hearts be always cheerful. Their favorites? 316, 316.
one more favorite, first and last. Yes? 230. 230. I believe we do not know this song. 276. 276, first and last. service. Thank you for your participation. rise as we will have a silence prayer. Thank you. Good evening. By the grace of the Lord, we'll open our meeting tonight and uh, praise the Lord with song 94, O oh, Worship the King.
Before we have a moment of prayer, I would like to read the Bible verse for tonight. It's in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship with his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer to invite the divine presence among us. Our almighty God, Father which art in heaven, in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son and our Savior and Redeemer, we worship thee tonight and thank thee for this opportunity to be gathered together in this house of prayer, Lord. And before anything, we thank thee for our lives, for our families, for this year that you protected us and you help us to be here at this time where to celebrate and to be together and giving thanks to the Lord for this annual spiritual conference. Lord, you know us better than us we know. As we come before thee, we need thy presence in our hearts. Please, cleanse our hearts, Lord, our mind, and help us to receive the message from tonight. Bless thy servant, and to the Holy Spirit, lead him, influence his mind to deliver the, the message that you want to deliver to us. Bless our audience, our small congregation tonight, and also bless our people that cannot be here present, that are watching online, and the people that are in their home suffering or in different circumstances. Bless all of them that they want to prepare for the Sabbath and for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for everything in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Dear brethren, distinguished guests and visitors, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here for this special event, a annual a spiritual conference where we would like to have the Word of God in the midst of us as a blessing. And as in the ancient Israel, it was an opportunity for them to dedicate or to renew the covenant with the Lord every year. I believe this is an opportunity for us. So as we were just preparing for this conference, for this event, the local church, and uh, cleaning every part of the building outside and everywhere, Brother Walter and I were just thinking, and we just spoke here in the prayer meeting, how wonderful it would be if we'll prepare our hearts as well as we did in the physical, you know, world and to prepare our hearts because this is the, the meaning of this uh, meeting here. To receive uh, all the time when we are gathered together and a special occasion as this one, the Lord promised that he can pour his Holy Spirit in abundant measure on, on us. So I would like, if it's not too much and I believe it's not late, to open our hearts to the word of God and to ask him to cleanse our hearts indeed and to give us Lord, the power and the strength that we need and the wisdom from above and love to understand his character and to prepare ourselves for the second coming. I believe this could be uh, done if we cooperate with the Lord. Sometimes we are looking around and maybe we think about could become something like a traditional. But I would like to encourage you to think different tonight. It's not something traditional. It's something that we have the occasion to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. May the Lord hear our prayers. 
and our burning desire from our hearts. Because I believe this is the only purpose that we are here, to meet with the Lord and to receive his Holy Spirit in abundant measure. May the Lord bless you and be with you all. And with the people that uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to our Lord that he protected our guests and visitors from far away that they traveled. And he just gave them the mercies and protection. So also we would like to express our gratitude for our speak, uh, guest speaker that they came from far away. And tonight we have the opportunity to have uh, Pastor Adrian Fanaro, which is going to share the word of God with us. May God bless us. Amen. Good evening, brethren. Well, it's always a, it's, there is always a tendency to say happy Sabbath from the pulpit, right? Especially as we come close to the, to the, to the sacred hours. I mean, it, it was um, uh, almost an hour ago that somebody met me at the door and said happy Sabbath. It feels like Sabbath, doesn't it? Already. You know, sometimes I drive on the streets on Sabbath as I go to church. And I look around and I see people going back and forth um, to their activities. And I wonder, how would it be not to have a special day of rest and of worship? And, um, you know, I, I was young when I gave my heart to the Lord. And I understood the importance of having a free day. At my age, almost all days were free because, you know, I didn't have any any work, I would just go to school. But now, um, when I work, and uh, especially when we work hard, when Sabbath comes, we feel delighted, right? We feel well that we finally have the opportunity to rest, not only physically, but also mentally and spiritually. And uh, coming together as a church is always special. Uh, speaking of which, as I was uh, driving down the road towards uh, this church, uh, some very positive emotions uh, were becoming overwhelming as I was talking to Clara about our canvassing experience. Uh, Clara was asking, uh, maybe we were the ones canvassing those houses, or she was saying, did we canvass these houses? Uh, it was special to spend together a few days going uh, from house to house, meeting different people, and every time you come back, you feel like you are back home, right? Um, it's really special. Again, I want to praise the Lord for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Brother Walter and the, the field brethren for inviting me and my family. Unfortunately, not all of them could make it, but it's always special to come here. And I was telling Brother Marion that in the 15 years that I've been in North America, this is my second spiritual conference here in Toronto. Uh, the first one was the first year that I was here in, uh, in North America. It was uh, quite interesting. So it's, um, it's good to look back and see how the Lord has led every one of us uh, throughout the years. And... Um, so it is always special to be here. Today, we are going to talk about one of my favorite topics at the personal level. And, uh, and then the sec my second study is uh, another favorite of mine, which is evangelism, uh, sharing with others the gospel and the love of Jesus. So today is about knowing God. How many of us know about God? Thank you. How many of us know God? Mm -hmm. It's a different story, right? Knowing about God and knowing God are two distinct things, right? We can talk a lot about knowing about God. 
We can share with others, with eloquence, what we know about God. But knowing God is something different. Knowing God, for some of us, was a strange experience. And God is so amazing that he can reveal himself to us, even in the moments when we do not look for an experience with him. Isn't that wonderful? There are so many people who uh, seemingly come to know Jesus by chance. We all know that nothing is by chance in this world, right? But seemingly, it happens out of nowhere. It's, it's one of the expressions we use. We go out for something and we come back different persons because we have met Jesus, right? And this is the kind of an experience I would like to share with you today. It's not, it's, we, I'm not going to give a lecture about how to look for God and how to intentionally look for an experience with Him, but how to be so sensitive in our hearts that we would identify God talking to us or revealing himself to us in the strangest moments of our lives. I would like to talk about um, a few examples from the Bible just to illustrate how God sometimes works in such a strange way that it is difficult to identify his voice talking to us unless we are really sincere in our hearts. And the first example I, I would like uh, us to talk about is um, um, the disciples. The disciples of John. When, when Jesus was introduced by John as being the Lamb of God, there was a little bit of confusion among the disciples of John. Remember that some of them came concerned to John and said, John, what do we do? There are many of your disciples following Jesus. They are forsaking you. And John said, don't worry. What did he say? I must decrease and he has to decrease. Because he understood that his mission was exactly preparing the way for Jesus' coming, right? So when, when the, his disciples were leaving him for Jesus, to him it was mission complete, mission fulfilled, right? He fulfilled his mission. To others, it was a disaster. When the moment comes for people to leave you, what does it look like, success or in success? It looks like in success, right? But for John, knowing his mission, he said, this to me is success. If they follow Jesus, that means I've done my job properly. It's amazing. But two of the disciples started following Jesus. And they were walking behind him. Suddenly, Jesus turns around, looks at them and asks them, what are you looking for? Now, I don't know the tone of the voice. I don't know whether, whether it was a kind tone or it was a critical tone. But he, the Bible says that he turned around and asked them, what are you looking for? John 1.38. And they, I, I believe that they, they got a little intimidated and they didn't know what to say and they came up with, with a question. Lord, we want to know where you live. When we walk behind Jesus and he turns around and he is asking us, what are you looking for? Shouldn't, don't we usually think, isn't this obvious? Isn't this obvious? Isn't this obvious that I'm looking for you? It's kind of strange for Jesus to ask, what are you looking for when, when the two disciples exactly after they had heard John saying, this is the Lamb of God, now two disciples follow him and Jesus turns around and says, what are you looking for? It is obvious we are looking for you. But they didn't know what to say. They got intimidated and said, Lord, we just wanted to know where you live. 
Isn't that sometimes our experience? We don't dare say exactly what's in our hearts. I believe these disciples had heard John preaching so much about the kingdom of God approaching that when they saw that Jesus finally came, they wanted to know how to experience salvation. And then when Jesus gave them the opportunity to say what they had to say, I believe they said something differently. They, they did not express the desire of their hearts. Their need was not to know where Jesus lived. Their need was of Jesus. Their need was for Jesus to live in their hearts. But they didn't know how to express it. And many times we lose in our experience just because we don't dare express what we really have in our hearts. Because we look around and we wonder about how what we say is going to affect us. And we have so many interests in, in this life that we forget about our, about our main interest, which is to know Jesus, to know God. So today we are going to talk about some of these uh, Bible characters who came to know Jesus out of the blue, as we say sometimes, out of nowhere. And the first example I want to use, besides the disciples, is the, the example of Paul, who used to be called what? What? He, he used to be called what? Saul. Now, was he young or was he old? He was relatively young, right? Compared to other members in the Sanhedrin. As a young man, he wanted to make an impact. He didn't want to live a, a regular life. He didn't want to, to wait for the small steps to be taken for him to become a really important leader in the Sanhedrin. He wanted to go on the fast lane, right? So he didn't wait to be told what to do. What did he do? He took the initiative and went to the, uh, to the leaders and asked for letters to do what? If I understand correctly, he asked for letters to go outside of his jurisdiction. Right? He wanted to do more than what people regularly did. He wanted to advance and advance fast. He had dreams. He wanted to make a difference. So he went to the, to the leaders and said, you know what, I, you know, I finished the work that you gave me, now I want to go beyond it. I want to do extra work. I want to look for these disciples of Jesus everywhere and arrest them. And the Bible says that he went up to Damascus to arrest men and women to bring them to Jerusalem. And the Bible, the Bible also says that he was there witnessing the death of Stephen. He went above and beyond. He had a dream and he wanted to accomplish it soon. And as he was going towards finding the disciples of Jesus, he saw a light, a strong light, and he heard the voice Talking to him, Saul, Saul, why? Why persecutest thou me? We know that his sight was affected. And suddenly he asked, Lord, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And what was the next thing he said? He said, Lord... It's what Paul said was, Lord, what do you want me to do? And now Jesus tells him, tells him, gives him the address of one of the Christians, right? Isn't that what he's doing? He is giving him the address of one of the, of, of, uh, the disciples. And that was exactly what, uh, what uh, Saul was looking for, wasn't he? He was looking for who? He was looking for Christians. And there is the Lord telling him the address of one of the most devoted Christians. And then Paul goes, I mean, Saul goes to that address. And when, when, uh, um, when the Christian, the devoted Christian, hears that Saul was coming, what did he think? 
He, he, is, he is coming to get me, right? He is coming to get me. And then Paul, inst- or Saul, instead comes and is asking to, to, to know what? He is asking for information, for more information about who? About God. Now, was he looking for God? Or was he looking to kill Christians, the followers of God? Who was he looking for? Well, according to him, he was doing a service for God, right? He was a devoted Jew. Um, According to him, he was well knowledgeable of the law. He was a Pharisee. He knew everything about God. But did he know God? He didn't know God. So he went to persecute the Christians, but he was doing it so sincerely that God said, this is the moment that Saul will come to know me, not about me, right? And through that experience, Saul knew God, and after he knew God, his name was changed to Paul. And in his writings, he says, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, I'm going to read again, because this is quite interesting. Because he gives a list of things that he was, or things that he had known before, right? And then he says, but all of this, (laughs) he says, I count a loss. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. So when he studied in, in, in the schools, when he became a Pharisee, what was he studying about? What was he studying about? Wasn't it about God? Wasn't it? Yes, it was. And now he says that all of those things he considers a loss for what? For the knowledge of who? Of Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. Weren't those the same things? I mean, what he had learned in the books and what he learned directly from Jesus, wasn't it the same thing? Yes, it was. The difference was that one was theoretical and the other one was practical. One was the knowledge about God and the other one was the knowledge of God himself. It was different. When he knew about God, he was Saul the persecutor. When he got to know God, he became Paul the persecuted. But the question is, did he go out of his house looking for Jesus looking for an experience, or according to him, he had already known God. He knew everything about God. He didn't know, he didn't need more knowledge. What he needed was to do the work. And that work was to persecute the Christians. Did he go out of his house with the thought of knowing God? Did he? No. How come he knew God? I mean, why is that happening to Saul? Because God is answering the the prayer of the heart, not the prayer of the mouth in this case. He knew uh, uh, Saul. He knew what he really needed, even though Saul did not express his need, right? Because he, he seemed to be already a complete Christian. He did not express his need. But God, who knew the heart, gave him exactly what he needed without him ever expressing a prayer which included meeting Jesus at a personal level. God, Jesus, made himself manifest to Saul without Saul ever saying, Lord, I want to know you more. He thought he knew everything. What he needed actually was a personal experience with Jesus. And once once he knew Jesus at a personal level, he became exactly the opposite what, of, of what he was. He became a persecuted being instead of a persecutor. You know, sometimes 
Things happened to us that we, we never expected, we never thought of, we, needed, we, we never prayed for. We go out of the house one person and we come back a different person. And people look at us and say, what happened to you? They are wondering what happened to us. The reason I'm having this study is not so that we have more knowledge about the truth. The, the reason I'm sharing it is because I know that there are some of us who can identify themselves with Paul or with Saul. We think we have the knowledge. We think we know everything. We, we think we know the way to everlasting life. And we come out of our house with this confidence in our hearts. And suddenly God is revealing something about ourselves or he is revealing something about life that will change us forever. I, I don't know how many of you came to this uh, conference uh, with expectations of a change. Because you probably think you don't need a change. But can it happen? Can a change take pla place during this uh, annual conference? Yes, it can take place. So what we should pray at home is, Lord, we do not know ourselves. We, I don't know myself. Like, like uh, the psalmist says, know, search me, and know me. See if, I, if I'm, uh, I, I'm not uh, on the way to everlasting life, right? See where I'm walking. Lead me to the everlasting life. Because we do not know ourselves. God is the one who decides, who should decide in our lives, what experience we are going to have. And so during this conference, I would like you to have your hearts open. Because in a strange way, God is going to reveal himself to you. And you are going to have the experience of your life that you probably never had. And you are going to wonder, what a privilege. I mean, you could look back and all the knowledge, the spiritual knowledge you have, you can say at the moment, I consider it a loss. Because now, I know Jesus at a personal level. Everything Paul had invested in was considered by him what? He goes so far as saying that he considered it garbage. You know, that, that's what he says in some of the languages. He considered what? That experience that he had had until he met Jesus personally, he considered it garbage. Why? Because that knowledge and self-justification led him to persecuting Christians. That's what fanaticism can do in our lives. A theoretical knowledge of the truth without a practical experience with Jesus can lead us to such a zeal that we are becoming persecutors. I mean, I know there were uh, uh, many political wars took place in the world, but according to history, the most cruel wars were, were having the origin where? In religion, right? This is what people can do with the knowledge, with the theoretical knowledge of, of the truth. They can kill others with it, with that knowledge. So Paul lo so looks back, or Paul now, and says, Everything that I've studied, everything that I know, I, I knew before I made Jesus, it is considered what? A loss. It's garbage. In comparison to the, the, to the practical knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. The point here is, he didn't ask for an experience, but he got it. He never prayed for it, but he received it. How can that happen? And I believe that after investing so much in his education and everything else, calling this a, 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 a garbage, probably the only, the only remorse he had was that he had not given a chance to Jesus sooner. Right? Probably he thought, man, I, I, I wish I had done this sooner. Before I knew all of these things, before I had all of these experiences which exalted me, exalted the selfishness in me, I wish I, I, I didn't have to, to go through all of that. His only regret was that he hadn't known Jesus sooner. So I, I would like to ask the young people today, the young people who are investing in, in a lot of things. I mean, today it's hard to keep up with the young people, right? They have so many thoughts, so many plans, and the opportunities that, that 
life is offering to them are opportunities that life did not offer to us back then, right? But to them, everything is open. And they are thinking about so many things. They are so busy in their minds that it's hard for them to stop for a moment and think about a, a different experience. Right? And today, you think about so many plans, about so many things, about investing in so, uh, um, uh, so many diverse things that one day, when you get to know Jesus, you are going to have to give up on them. Right? You are going to look back and say, man, I wish I had known Jesus sooner. So I didn't have to invest in, in all, or invest in the same things, but with a different mindset. You know, um, usually when you, you ask young people why they study and why they invest so much in their future, is because it, they say, the majority of them say that they do not want to end up poor like their parents. So they want to make a life for themselves. They want to be different. They, they, they don't want to suffer like their parents did. Right? Man, very few of the young people, when you ask them why they study and why they invest so much in their future, very few of them say, it's because I want to get this knowledge, I want to get an education, so I can reach out to the higher class of, of people. Which is a different mindset, right? One thing is study to, to make a name for yourself in the world. It's another thing to study so you can make yourself available to that, kind, to that class of people, so you can share the gospel with them. Well, when, when that is the mindset, go all the way for it, because God is going to give you success as you get to know Him and share Him with others, right? The only remorse, the only regret Paul had was that he hadn't done it sooner, right? And one day, you young people are going to have an, a similar experience, and you are going to look back and say, man, if I had known this, I would have done things differently. And this is why I am addressing this message. So that you, unlike me, stop investing unwisely now. So that later you don't say, man, I wish I did it when Brother Adrian said it. Right? Right? Think about it. I'm not asking you to make drastic changes in your lives. Ask God, Lord, if the way I'm going on is not to life everlasting, change it. Change it. I'm up to it. And God is going to change it. If you are sincere like Paul, you see, Paul got it even without asking. Even more so will you who are asking for it. It's going to be amazing. Now, the other example I want to use is very similar to the experience of Paul, but uh, he had a greater experience, and he was already established as a learned man, uh, as a man of influence, and this is Nicodemus, right? Now, um, when you read about Nicodemus, the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, you will find out that he was already at an advanced, more advanced age than Paul, uh, he was already a leader in the Sanhedrin. He didn't need to ask for letters from anyone, right? He could do anything because he was an influential person, right? He was so influential that the thought of losing his reputation stopped him, hindered him from going to Jesus openly, right? Right or wrong? Right. He, the reputation he had built hindered him from declaring himself a follower of Jesus, or not even an ad admirer of Jesus. He couldn't say he was an admirer of Jesus. But what did he do? Because he was a smart man, he said, look, I can get to know Jesus, I can get to meet Jesus, and nobody will know about it. Right? So what did he do? He, he went to look for Jesus when nobody could see him. He went at night. Now, why do you think he wanted to meet Jesus? In, in, in the profundity of his heart, why do you think he wanted to see Jesus? Well, just think about that a, a moment. So he comes to Jesus in John 3, verses 1 and 2. He comes and says, 
Rabbi, I'm paraphrasing here, he said, I know you are a teacher. What was Nicodemus? He was a teacher, so he addressed to Jesus the same way people were addressing Nicodemus. Rabbi or teacher, you are a teacher, I'm a teacher. The difference between us is that you work, you, you do, you, you work out miracles. I mean, if God were not with you, you could not, have, you could not do it. So he came to Jesus, and instead of saying what was really in his heart, he said, no, let's exchange some theolo theological knowledge. I am a teacher, you are a teacher, we are at the same level, you tell me, I tell you, we exchange some, uh, some, uh, um, um, some knowledge about what we know, and then everybody goes home, and we are a little smarter than we were before we met. Right? Isn't that how he really came? So Jesus looked at him, and what does he answer? He says, in verse 3, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, why did Jesus say that? Because what Nicodemus really needed was not more knowledge, was it? No. What he needed was what? What he needed was an experience of new birth. And Jesus answered the spoken prayer? No. Which prayer did he answer? The prayer of the heart. And he answered to Nicodemus exactly what he needed. What Nicodemus needed was to be born again. He had the knowledge. He had everything. What did he need? He, need to be, he needed to be born again. And Jesus answered that unspoken prayer. He was hiding the desire to know Jesus behind his theology behind his influence. There was a desire. But all those things that he had accomplished before were hindering from knowing Jesus personally. He also, just like Paul, he knew everything about God. He knew everything about the kingdom of God. But he was not born again. And what he needed right now was not more knowledge. It was an experience with Jesus. And he received something that his heart was desiring, but he hadn't. Spoken it to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus can answer unspoken prayers. And we will come to the present again. You know, we, there are many teachers of the Bible here. And I think sometimes we need to stop from teaching. We need to stop from studying for others. And study for ourselves, take a moment to get to know Jesus, because we know a lot about him, don't we? And we like to teach about him, and that's something good. But once in a while, you know, somebody said once, a, 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 a good friend of mine, an experienced minister, he said, you know, sometimes I feel the need to be rebaptized. I actually had a chance to baptize one of our pastors, you know, when, when he was already retired. But there are some of us who are so busy teaching others that we forget that we need to renew our experience with Jesus. Just like Nicodemus. He was so overwhelmed with knowledge that he, he, he stopped at nothing to teach others, in his desire to teach others. And he wanted to teach Jesus some, some of his, uh, uh, experience, uh, ex, um, some of his uh, experience. And he ended up, now if you look at, at uh, his, if you read the Desire of Ages, for example, you will see what the Desire of Ages says, say about him. Did he become an open admirer and an open disciple to Jesus? Did he? Yes, he did, but not before his death. Not before the death of Jesus, right? He did it afterwards. I mean, he went so far as to go and ask permission to do what? N he didn't ask for letters to go persecute Christians. He went and asked for permission to do what? To take Jesus off the cross and bury him. 
That's amazing. He, he openly declared himself a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. What do you think was his only regret? What do you think was his only regret? His only regret was that he hadn't done it before. I mean, imagine the, his story, what his story would have been like. To give his heart to Jesus right then, that night, when Jesus told him, you need to be born again. Instead of going in the theory of the birth and go back into the womb of the mom, you know, you know just forget about that. Accept the fact that this is why you came here. You didn't come here to learn about how you can be born again. You came here to be born again. Not to learn about it. His only regret was that he hadn't given his heart to Jesus then, right then, that night. And then the next day, go all around and say, I am a disciple of Jesus. I had an experience with Jesus. This is what he did for me. He didn't do that. He ended up going and, and, and showing faith in what? In a dead body, right? This is what, I mean, he went as far as, as humbling himself and say, look, I am a disciple, I am the disciple of a dead Savior. According to, to what the people were seeing, right? Now remember the verse we read at the beginning, that I may know him and what? And the power of what? Of his resurrection. Because uh, Nicodemus believed that the life for Jesus was not going to end there. Apparently, he was trusting a dead Savior. But no, that Savior was going to be alive again, right? It's, a, it's an amazing story. We don't have time to go through all of it, but it's wonderful. His only regret was that he hadn't done it sooner. What do you think our regret is going to be one day or two days or one year or two years after this day? What do you think our only regret is going to be when we will finally give our hearts to Jesus. The only regret we are going to have is that, look, that year, 2019, when we had that annual conference in Toronto, we had our opportunity. There were appeals made from the pulpit. We could have given our hearts to Jesus. And we didn't do it. We kept investing in what we think is important, and now we consider it a garbage for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But that experience can happen now. Can't it? The Spirit of Prophecy says that every conference could be an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to be poured in great, great measure. This is the opportunity. We can have the experience. The experience that we, even if you never prayed for it, if you are sincere in your heart, and God knows that this is what you are looking for, this is what He is going to give you during this conference. He can give it to you tonight. He can give it to me tonight. <clears throat> now remember there was a woman who was suffering from bloodshed the Bible says that she had spent everything she had and she did not become better the Bible even says goes so far as saying that her situation became what? worse right? she had a, a, a terrible experience 12 years suffering. And now she hears that Jesus was close by. What does she do? The moment she hears Jesus was close by, she thought, this is my only opportunity. And be better than anything, she heard that Jesus was healing the, the sick with no pay, right? Right? She had no money left. She could not even go to a doctor anymore. And her situation was becoming worse. She said, Jesus is here. I'm going to be healed once for all. This is my opportunity. So she went out to look for Jesus. He was busy. She didn't care. She went through the crowd. She, uh, the Bible says that she thought, man, if I could at least touch his robe. If I touch his robe, I'm going to be healed. And, and that's what happened, right? She touched the rope, but, but it didn't end there. It didn't end there. She hasn't left the place until Jesus told her, actually, thy faith has made thee, what? 
whole. What does whole mean? Body, mind, and spirit, right? Isn't that what it means? What did she come for? What was her prayer? Her desire was to be healed, right? From that bloodshed for 12 years. She was suffering from, for 12 years. And what did she receive in exchange? She received healing of the whole being, including spiritually. She was saved. What did she come for? For physical healing. What did she receive? Her prayer, her inner prayer was answered, right? Thy faith has made thee whole. And now thinking about, for example, the, the, the Samaritan woman. What did she come to, the, to Jacob's well for? He came for? She came for the physical water. What did she receive in, 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 uh, in exchange? What did she receive? She received the spiritual, the living water, the spiritual water. What, I mean, the moment she, she heard about it, she said, Lord, give me this water. Give me this water. But she hadn't come there for that, right? In a strange way, God brought salvation to her. In a, in a strange way. When she woke up, she didn't know that would happen. Did she? No. But this is what she received. Now, coming back to us. When we come to a conference... You know, we, I, we even hear young people, if you really ask them, you know, and, and they trust to tell you the truth, many of them are going to tell you why they came to the conference. I mean, I have my experiences with the young people, and sometimes I like to talk to them and ask them, you know, why did you come here? And because they, we have a good experience together, they, they, are, they are telling me, you know, some of them say, you know, I came here to make more friends, or I came here to to meet my friends that I already had. I came here to gain more knowledge. You know, I'm just curious about what is going to be taught here. And some say, you know, in my local church there are no girls, no boys, so I, you know, I, if I stay in my local church I will never get married. So I, I went to this conference, I came to this conference because I want to, to get to know somebody. I, I want to have a boyfriend, to have a girlfriend. Right? Otherwise I will end up you know, I will die lonely. Um, and, and others come to the conferences to show off, right? I mean, they practice all year long, and now there is an opportunity on the big stage to show what they've practiced. They want to show how they can play instruments, and they want to show how they can sing, right? Yeah, it's true. You know, sometimes I go to show uh, uh, how good I can preach, right? You know, can I do that or not? It can happen, can't it? We come for different reasons. But I want to tell you that in, in, in the bottom of our hearts, our desire is to have an experience. An experience that we can count forever. An experience that could change our lives. An experience that we never had. And that experience could be today for all of us knowing Jesus at a personal level. And now I'd like to take a moment to talk to the parents. You know, it, it's what they call teenage years or pre-teenage years, right? When, when our children get to grow, get to, get to um, form their own individuality, Right? And they, they are looking to gain independence from their parents. Anybody is familiar with that, with those moments? Yeah, I am. Those are critical moments in the lives of our children. And that's when we see reflected in their eyes and in their lives the neglect of, a, of many years from us as parents. When they are small, they don't know how to express it, right? They don't express it. I mean, some of them are afraid to say anything so that they would not get their parents mad, right? 
They are small, and we believe that they will be small forever. And we are working so hard to provide for them that we are missing out on what they really need to be provided for, which is a, for the spiritual life and for a personal touch from their parents. We work hard, and I know there are a lot of Europeans here, because I know Europeans better than any other culture. I know that Europeans work really hard. Everybody does for the family, don't we? Everybody works hard for the family to provide toys for the children to play with. And in the end, because we, we work so hard to provide those toys for our children, we miss out on what they need most. What they need, what they need most is, is us as parents to play with, not the toys. But it's easier to provide toys than taking the time to play with them, right? So we neglect them in a strange way, right? Because you cannot call that neglect. Going to work for them, you cannot call it neglect, can you? But we neglect the, the most intimate relationship with our children, the personal relationship. And then they grow up, we keep providing for them, they grow up, and, and suddenly, at the dinner table, my boy or your boy comes out with something coming out of their ears. Right? Now they are wireless. They are not so long, not so obvious anymore. But it happens. They come to the teenage years, and they come to the dinner table with those uh, earplugs in their ears. They don't hear anything we are talking about at the dinner table. They even move their heads in the direction the music is leading them, right? And we get scared. And we become anxious and say, what happened to my children? <coughs> my children are rebellious. My children listen to bad music. My children watch bad movies. I've seen parents come to us as pastors and say, Pastor, save my children. They are getting lost. What happened? You know, they were okay. <coughs> they were okay. Until the other day when they changed totally. My question is, were they okay or we didn't see signs of them being not okay? Were they okay? I don't think so. They were not okay all along, but we didn't have time to see it. We didn't sit down to talk to them. We didn't get to know them. They are strangers to us. And then, and then they come out with these strange ideas, and they come out with this attitude that we cannot accept. And what happens between us and the children? What happens? We have a conflict, right? Because they have their own individuality, which we didn't assist, right? In, in directing the, the right way, we didn't assist them, so they grew wild. And the personality they have is not, uh, is not correct. The, the problem was that when they were small, you were so big in comparison to them that they didn't dare say it. But it was in their hearts. So now that they are closer to your height, they are going to say it straight to your face. You know, I'm not interested in religion. They are going to say it. I'm not interested in Jesus. I like my music. I like to watch movies. You can do nothing about it. Right? I have my freedom. They are going to say it to you because they are closer to your height. When we see them do this, how do we react? This makes the whole difference in the world. How do we react? You know, sometimes we, I mean, we shout at them. We react ourselves, right? And there is going to be a conflict that our children will end up not even coming to the dinner table anymore. They are going to stay in their, in, their, in their rooms. What do we do? Well, there is something missing. In whatever we see them do, is where they think they will find what they need for the emptiness in their hearts. They think that with that music, they are going to patch what's missing in their hearts. They think that through the movies, they are going to receive that satisfaction that they've been looking for and they keep, they keep patching and patching and patching <coughs> until nothing of the original heart is there. 
because it is all patched up. And we, as parents, keep reacting and keep reacting until they may be lost. We need to identify that in their reaction, they are looking for Jesus. They're looking for Jesus. You know, I have, I have parents come to me and say, my, my, my son would play soccer all day, and he always goes to play soccer. What do I do? What do I do? Should I take soccer away from him? They ask. No, no. They are looking for Jesus. And they think that soccer is going to give them what Jesus would. Just bring Jesus into the home. Bring Jesus into their lives. And they, at any moment, when they see our sincerity, they would choose Jesus rather than soccer. But Jesus has been missing from our lives as parents for such a long time. We had the theory of the truth, but we, we, hadn't met Jesus. we haven't met Jesus. We, we had all the knowledge about Jesus, but we didn't have the knowledge of Jesus. <coughs> I invite you, invite you tonight, from the bottom of my heart, as one who has children, you know, who are teenagers for a little while more, one of them, right? But I have the experience. I want to change. And I'm asking God to change me. My children may not even ask for a change. But if I, as a parent, bring Jesus on their way, in whatever they go, whatever direction they will go, they will come face to face with Jesus. And Jesus will reveal himself to them. And they are going to say, wait a minute, I came here to watch a movie, and here I am meeting Jesus. Just like Paul, right? He came to persecute the Christians and he met Jesus. How did that happen? You know, one day your children are going to come home and they are going to cry and say, Father, Mother, forgive me. I'm sorry. I didn't know better. I thought I was going to be satisfied. I didn't know that the only one who could satisfy my needs was Jesus. But now that I do know, I consider all of the things that I invested in until now, I consider it garbage. And my only regret is that I haven't done it sooner. I haven't done it when you, Daddy, told me. I haven't done it when you, Mom, were praying for me. You know, sometimes our children are even asking us to not pray for them. I've seen children asking the parents not to pray for them because their case is lost. They have no interest anymore. What do they really say through that? What do they really say? When they say, don't pray for me, in their heart, what they feel is the need of prayer. So should we stop to pray for them? No. And the last case I'm going to mention briefly is the case of the man possessed by demons who is the most striking of all. The disciples came from the other side of the lake, tired after fighting with waves for all night. And there, there they come, finally trying to get the rest, and this man comes running towards them. What did they do? They ran away. But who stood there to meet the man? Jesus. And what did the man say to Jesus? What did the man say? He said, I have nothing to do with you, Jesus. Nothing to do with you. Did Jesus answer that prayer, which actually meant go away from me? Did he answer that prayer? Which prayer did Jesus answer? The prayer of the heart. And when Jesus answered the prayer of the heart, the man was healed. He looked around, he looked at himself, and he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. I'm a changed man. I didn't even ask for it. And Jesus healed me. Why? <coughs> because Jesus answered the prayer of the heart. And I want you, who still have teenagers, to look at your children. And whatever they say, negative, whatever reaction they have, just consider that a prayer, 
a prayer of the heart which says, Mom, Dad, I need salvation. I need Jesus. Bring him into the home and I will be saved. Now, to, tomorrow, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to have the opportunity, I understood, to continue my presentation. And that presentation is going to be, what do you do after you meet Jesus? What do you do? What comes naturally in your heart? And how do we prove to ourselves that we really met Jesus? May that will help us tonight to take a moment, look at our children, look at them in their eyes, you know, take a moment and pray with them, take a moment and speak with them, and ask them, son, daughter, what is your experience? Is your experience si similar to that of Saul? Is your experience similar to that of Nicodemus? Is your exper experience similar to that of the possessed man? Or is it the experience of the Samaritan woman? You know, ask them, what is your experience like? And you will be amazed to, to find out so many new things about your children just because you took a moment just between you and them. I promise you will find out a lot. May the Lord help us um, to meet Jesus ourselves and be able to share him to others. Amen. We are thankful to God for this message and also thank Brother Adrian for presenting this uh, message. So we'll have the opportunity as uh, in this uh, uh, occasion when the people they get together from different other parts of the world in the feast, annual feast to enjoy the music. Uh, it, it is written in Desire of Ages that they were uh, open their hearts for the sacred music and the message from the Word of God. So we'll invite our youth to play in the orchestra, local church and other people that are joining. And uh, I think they are almost here. <laughs> So I will take this opportunity to share with you a few words. Um, we noticed that um, the message for our conference is make your life count. How many of you believe that we are precious to the Lord? And how many of us believe that our life count for the Lord? Is it precious in his hands? So. But I do believe that we need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not going to change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we fail, it is because we trust in our strength. But trusting in the Lord, as Peter had a last, a last look to the Lord Jesus Christ, if we fail, we can look again to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he, Peter looked to him, when he was condemned, was taken by force to be crucified, please meditate on the last scenes of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have another look, and maybe our life will count, will, will be changed, and let us make our lives count for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll have the opportunity now to hear a wonderful song, When Peace Like a River.
bless you and keep you in his arms so now we come to the end of our meeting tonight and uh, I would like to invite you to praise the Lord with a song 274 I trust in God wherever I may be and at this time we will open the Sabbath as well we'll mark the opening of the Sabbath and praise the name of the Lord with this song Please, let us stand and praise the Lord with this song.
Let us have a word of prayer and we invite Brother Adrian to lead us in prayer. Our merciful Father, which art in heaven, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you so much for bringing us together from different parts of this field and beyond. We thank you that um, you've uh, spoken to us again, and we pray that uh, your voice may sound sweeter than any voice. Um, may our hearts be cheered with um, what you, you have to tell us, to share with us tonight. And may we all understand the need to know you, not about you, but to know you as a personal Savior. Amen. Forgive us our sins, our negligence, especially in our relationships as parents and children and um, pastors and members of the church. Lord, we pray that just like you have promised, we would have the experience of the room above, that during this conference our hearts may be filled with your spirit and may this experience motivate us to go out and share with others what you have done for us. We thank you for the Sabbath day, for um, the opportunity to continue sharing with one another on this special day. Help us to keep it holy through your grace, and um, may all our thoughts and our words may be directed to you and to one another for edification. In the name of Jesus, we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. You may have seat. Happy Sabbath. Blessed Sabbath day to you. And uh, for this moment, I will invite Brother Walter for a short announcement for all of us. So please come forward. Okay. Especially brethren who have traveled long, long distances um, from the United States, from Montreal, from Ottawa. Welcome to our conference. Um, you know, today is the first day of summer. So sunshine is here, warmth is here. And also I understand for people in elementary school, our children and youth and high school, this is the last day of the school, right? So you are free. Um, usually we have a conference just before the school starts. This year we have it when the school ends. But you will enjoy it, I'm pretty sure. This evening was such a wonderful experience. Uh, the message filled with truth the Lord Jesus speaking to us through the Holy Spirit, through his messenger. And I am looking forward to hear more. So we welcome you here. I'd like to just give you a quick announcement for tonight, tomorrow. Um, first question is, does everyone have accommodation? Everyone is accommodated. If everyone doesn't, anyone doesn't have accommodation, please see... Brother Dorin, Brother Dorin, would you please rise for a second? Most people, I mean, we all know you, but maybe. So if you need accommodation, please uh, see Brother Dorin, but we trust that you are accommodated. Tomorrow morning, we will start um, Sabbath school at 9.30. And um, Brother George will lead in the Sabbath school, and Brother Etienne and Brother Dorin will be the teachers. Then we will have a worship service at 11 o'clock. Brother Livio will be the our guest speaker, and he will continue with communing with God. After knowing God, we want to have fellowship with him and commune with him. He will speak on that topic. In the afternoon, we will have a lunch, fellowship lunch here tomorrow, and then in the afternoon, we will have a first a special service, which will be a joyful and solemn service, which is ordination. Two our gospel workers will be ordained. Brother Dorin Burka, who is ministering to our church in Puslinch, will be ordained to the gospel, a minister of gospel. And Brother Etienne uh, Lombard, who is uh, working in Montreal, he will be ordained as an elder. So we invite you for that occasion tomorrow at 3 o'clock. We will have a short break, and then young people's meeting will follow at about 5 o'clock. So please, items that you would like to present tomorrow, 
We have two young people who will be leading out. One is Heidi and the other is Caitlin. So please see them and report your items. So brethren, that would be everything for tonight. Is there anything else that I have omitted? Any questions, any concerns? If not, I wish you a good night rest. Enjoy your stay in Toronto with our families. I thank all the families who are accommodating our guests. And we will have more people tomorrow. May God bless you all and have good night rest and come again in the morning. God bless you. Good night. We will be ushered out. Yes. Thank you. And we will greet the brethren at the door. Thank you.